Okay, so I have four fairly simple goals for uh, today's presentation. First of all, I'm going to show you how to eliminate the federal deficit. I'm going to show you how to reduce employers' health care spending and premiums. I'm going to show you how to improve care for patients and get your employees back to work faster. And I'm going to show how to make physicians and hospitals more profitable. Now, you can tell me how well I did at the end of this, but you can imagine I'm going to have to cover a lot of stuff fairly quickly to cover all of that. And I will make all of these slides available to everybody, uh, so I'll even show you where you can download them at, uh, at the end. Now, this is the chart. Everybody shows these charts about the GDP. This is the chart that matters. The chart that matters is the fact that health care is the thing that is driving the federal deficit right now. All those folks in Washington debate about spending and everything. The issue is if they can't figure out how to fix Medicare spending, they're not going to be able to fix the deficit. But if you're sitting in Congress, you think you have two basic options, spending, quantity, times price. So your two choices are you can either cut services to seniors or you can cut fees to providers. Guess which one they're going to pick? Now, let me ask you, which major industry in America tells its key professionals that they're going to cut their salary at the end of the year by 25% whether they're, going to do, whether they're doing a good job or not? That's what Congress threatens doctors with every year. It's called the sustainable growth rate, and literally every year they're told at the end of the year, your pay is going to be cut by 25%. Now, of course, that's crazy to say that the key people in healthcare are going to have their salary cut by 25% whether they're doing a good job or not, so Congress never does it. But in fact, what has happened is they also haven't given them a pay increase for, for, a, dec for a decade. So their pay is actually 25% lower today than it was a decade ago because Congress hasn't figured out how to solve that particular problem. Now what has happened historically is that whenever Congress and Medicare cut fees to providers, they have to raise their prices to all of you to be able to make up the difference. That's the famous cost shift. The GDP chart that I like is this GDP chart that if you look at the blue bars are the public spending and the orange bars are the private spending in major developed countries around the, country, around the world. And you notice that the blue bars are actually the same. Public spending is the same as the percentage of GDP in every major developed country. What is not the same is the private spending because healthcare spending in this country is actually making private businesses uncompetitive in world markets because so much is being shifted on the private sector. And businesses are then shifting costs increasingly to employees. So employer contributions doubled during the decade of the 2000s, and they increased employee contributions tripled as a result of all that. What we need is a way to reduce healthcare costs without taking away stuff that patients need, and without cutting the fees to providers. But you can't do that from Washington. It has to be done at the local level, because that's where healthcare is actually delivered. Now, can that be done? A lot of people think it can't. Some of the discussion earlier on this morning suggested that you've got to take a lot of stuff away from patients. I don't buy that. I think there's three ways that you can reduce costs without rationing. One is by keeping patients healthy. They don't get sick. They don't have health care costs at all. If they do get a health problem, and particularly chronic disease, which is one of the major drivers of health care costs in the country, to help manage that condition in a way that doesn't have them ending up in the hospital as often and getting as un many unnecessary procedures as they do today. And when they do genuinely need something, that they don't get complications, infections, readmissions, and that they get that care as efficiently and effectively as possible. Now, the nice thing about thinking about health care costs this way is all of these things would save money. But they're all also quality improvements. And if we told the American people and the citizens of Wisconsin that what we're trying to do is to help you stay well, to help you avoid having to go to the hospital if you don't need to, and to make sure that when you do go to the hospital, you have a good outcome, I think most people would say, well, if that's what healthcare reform is about, sounds pretty good to me. How big are the opportunities? Well, they're huge. National data say that between 5 and 17 percent of all hospital admissions are potentially preventable. The chronic disease admissions, the unnecessary surgeries. We have three adverse events happening every minute in this country. Wrong side surgeries, infections, complications that cost billions of dollars. As Reed said, have been happening since the Quality Chasm Report and, and since and before. And a lot of the major specialty societies are starting to admit that a lot of the things that we do, two or four patients, aren't necessary and in some cases may actually be harmful to them. So, I think that rather than starting every conversation about health care spending with talking about the things that we want to take away from patients and how we're not going to give them that new technology or drug that could save their life, what we should be spending our time on is how to help the patients stay well, how to help them avoid going to the hospital if they don't need to, and make sure that they have better outcomes whenever they do go. 
What's the barrier? The barrier is the way we pay for health care today. Because if doctors and hospitals reduce infections, complications, and readmissions, they will lose money. If doctors and hospitals keep patients out of the hospital, they will lose money. And nobody in healthcare gets paid at all today when the patient stays well. That's not exactly a prescription for success going forward. So to understand how to fix that, I want to give you a very short course, very short course in the economics of healthcare. Part number one, where's the money going now? So these were numbers from a couple years ago. These were projected expenses. Uh, but left side is the commercial spending, close to a trillion dollars nationally. Right side is the half a trillion dollars in Medicare spending. And you can see where all the money is going, doctor services, hospital services, et cetera. But key thing about this chart, the physicians are only getting about 25% of the money. That's actually a little bit exaggerated because some of the things in there aren't really actually physicians. But they're getting about 25% of the money. Most of the money is going to something else, and it's going to things that physicians prescribe, control, or influence. So point number one is, you actually want the physicians to be working with you because they're the people that control most of the expenses. You don't want them to be your enemy. You want them to be your colleague and your partner. Let's talk about how the physicians get paid. So how much money does a highly productive primary care physician make? Well, I'll take a hy hypothetical, highly productive primary care physician. This, product, this physician has 2,000 patients. They work 250 days a year. They only take two, day, two weeks of vacation. They see patients seven hours every day. They see three patients every hour. They are like a machine working through those patients. They make 5,250 visits per year. How much do they get paid for that? <coughs> Medicare pays them $70 per visit. A lot of commercial people don't pay them a whole lot more than that. $70 for what's called a level three, typical 15-minute visit. Now, they do other things. They talk to patients on the phone. They call in prescriptions. They talk to specialists. They don't get paid for that at all. Doctors don't get paid for phone calls. They don't get paid for emails. They don't get paid for any of that. So when you add all that up, it sounds pretty good, right? This primary care physician is making $368,000 a year. Well, not quite because all of the revenue to the primary care practice comes when the doctor bills. So the primary care physician has to pay for all those other expenses out of that. They've got to pay for the medical assistant, the receptionist, the records, the billing clerk, the office manager, all the rent and furniture, all the medical supplies, all their insurance, et cetera. And these are typical average numbers for a primary care practice. They're actually a little bit on the low side. So when you add all that up, what comes out? The physician gets what's left after they pay all those expenses, because they've got to pay all those expenses. They can't run the practice without them. And that's not exactly enough to cover their medical school debt. So what's a doctor do? More visits. Let's see if we can get in four visits per hour to be able to actually make the numbers. Well, then you start to get to a number that actually starts to be enough to at least pay off medical school debt, put the kid through college, et cetera. Now, if that physician does what Reed said and said, I want to respond to the patients, I'm going to let them call instead of having to come into the office. Let them email me. I'll tweet back and forth in terms of whether, you know, what, what they need. So they don't have to come into the office as much. Lots more calls and emails per hour. Guess what? Physician practice goes bankrupt because we pay for office visits. That's all we pay for. We don't pay for phone calls or emails. Now, how much time is actually needed to be able to give good care? Well, this has been studied. This is from one study that said, so how much time do patients on average, some need less, some need more, but on average, a population of patients in a practice need? Well, they need time spent on preventive care, some of that call them up to make sure that they're getting what they need, chronic care, acute care, about two hours per year per patient on average. So if this physician has 2,000 patients that they're trying to manage, all they need is 16 and a half hours a day, every day, to be able to provide that care to the patient. Why not hire a nurse? Could hire a nurse, help do that, some of that care. Guess what? Nurses don't get paid for, so that comes out of the doctor's salary. Now, if you think I'm making all this up, I put this up, it is hard to read in the back, but this is a real live family physician who came to a meeting that we had in Cleveland a couple years ago. So I'm a family doc, I've got 1,800 patients, here's my day. I see 20 to 25 patients, average of three problems per appointment, I respond to 25 or 30 calls, I review 30 reports, I write or refill 25, 25 prescriptions, da 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 da. And then, when the day ends, I'm not done. I end up working in late into the night to be able to catch up on all the stuff I couldn't do during the day because I was seeing all those patients. 
And as hard as I work, I still can't get to everything my patients need, especially the ones who are complex. So I decided to hire a nurse. We don't do that in family medicine because it doesn't get paid for. But I decided I couldn't afford not to. And it was hard to give up part of my salary, but I thought that it was a good thing to do for the patients. So you have to ask yourself, is it any wonder that we say patients don't get the care that they need? In primary care, we come out with all these studies, 50% of the things patients need they don't get. Is it any wonder that the PCPs end up ordering lots of tests and sending them off to specialists when they have so little time to be able to spend with them? Do you think adding more quality measures on top of that is going to solve the problem alone? And should you ask them for discounts and send them more volume? Where exactly are they going to put them more volume? Wouldn't it be better to actually pay those primary care physicians differently, not necessarily more? A lot of PCPs say, I'm making salary okay, I just don't, I'm not happy with the way I have to earn it. This is not good patient care. Wouldn't it be better to pay them differently so they actually could answer the patient calls about urgent issues? They could keep open slots on their schedule so the people who really needed it could come in rather than go in the emergency room. Wouldn't it be nice if they could spend more time with the patients who really needed it? And wouldn't it be nice if they could actually enjoy their work more so that we could get more primary care physicians when we need them? How about the specialists? So the PCPs get paid $70 for an office visit. The specialists get paid a lot more than that, right? Double, triple. They get paid exactly the same amount. Specialists get paid exactly the same amount as PCPs. But the specialists have these things, other options. They can do procedures. They can do a stent and get paid $600 if you're a cardiologist. You can do hip surgery if you're an orthopedic surgeon and get paid $1,600 for that. So good for the specialists that they actually have things that they can do that they can earn more money at. The problem is not what they get paid. It's what else goes along with what they do. So when the stent gets done for the doctor getting paid $600, the hospital gets paid $7,000. Whenever the surgeon does the hip surgery for $1,600, the hospital gets paid $12,000. Those are Medicare numbers. Commercial numbers are a lot higher than that in most cases. Okay? Now, Tom asked the question earlier, what about shared decision making? Well, the studies, in fact, have shown that if you spend the time to talk to patients and explain to them what the risks are associated with surgery and what the trade-offs are, that in many cases, not by small amounts, by significant amounts, they will decide that they don't actually want that procedure done. 30% fewer stents, 40% fewer mastectomies, 20% fewer back surgeries. But look at how we pay. We don't pay the specialists to spend time talking to the patient about whether or not they should have the surgery or not. We pay them to do the surgery. That's how we pay. What about hospitals? Now, hospitals are big fixed-cost institutions. You know what the big difference is between hospitals and doctor's offices? Anybody want to know what the big difference is? Hospitals are open 24-7. We expect them to be there 24-7, not the doctor's office. We expect the hospital to be there no matter whether they have patients or not, they should be there staffed and ready to go in case somebody needs something. When there's a big accident on the freeway, when there's a flu epidemic, we expect them to be staffed and ready to go for that. Now, in some ways you'd say, well, maybe it's not surprising that hospitals then are actually the biggest and fastest growing number, uh, piece of costs. More money, top bar is hospitals, fastest rate of growth during the last decade was hospitals. So if you're going to do something about healthcare costs, you've got to do something about hospitals. That's where the money is. But let's look at the economics of a hospital. So I'm going to take some hypothetical hospital service line cardiac care, orthopedics, whatever it is. But I'm going to say, so the hospital invests, they have to invest a lot of money to be able to give good quality care. They have to have a surgery suite, they've got to have all that equipment that people expect them to have, the MRIs, the robotic surgery, whatever it is. So let's assume that they spend $6.7 million to equip this uh, uh, particular part of the hospital. And it costs them variable costs, $3,000 per patient. So every time they get a patient, they have to spend $3,000 more. So it may be for the hip implant, it may be for the stent, it may be for the thing, but they don't spend those things unless they get the patient. And let's assume that they get paid $10,000 per patient to do whatever it is that they do in this particular uh, part of the hospital, the hip surgeries or the stents or whatever. So if they get 1,000 patients come in the door, what are their costs going to be? Well, they have that $6.7 million in fixed costs that they have, 
plus they, get, they, have to, they spend an extra $3,000 for every 1,000 patients. So it'll cost them just under, nine million, under, just under $10 million to, to serve those patients. They'll get paid $10 million, $10,000 per patient to be able to serve those patients. So they make a small positive margin, 3%. Good news for the hospital, right? Now, notice most of the hospital's costs are fixed. They're not going to change depending on how many patients they have. So what would happen if they got more patients? If they got 1,200 patients, their costs would go up, but their costs wouldn't go up by 20%. Their costs would go up by that variable cost, the $3,000. The cost would only go up a little bit above $10 million. Their revenue, though, we pay per patient per procedure. They would get $10,000 more for every patient. So guess what? They suddenly have a 14% margin. Really good news for the hospital. Now, what if we convince the hospital that they shouldn't do as many procedures? What will happen to their costs? Well, their costs will go down. So if the number of patients goes down by 20%, their costs will go down, but their costs won't go down by 20%. Still at those fixed costs they've got to pay for. Costs will go down somewhat. Revenue, though, will go down by 20% if there's 20% fewer patients. So what happens to the hospital's margins? They're in the red. So from a hospital's perspective, it's not a good thing to have fewer patients because that's the equation. When the number of patients increases, revenue goes up faster than costs. When the number of patients goes down, revenue goes down faster than costs. Does any wonder why hospitals are a little concerned about us keeping patients out of the hospital? And in fact, it's really pretty dramatic. If you get 2% more patients, in my little hypothetical example here, the amount of contribution margin you're getting goes up by 50%. If you get 2% fewer patients, it goes down by 50%. Now, this is a significant slide to focus on for just one second because it means that you can move a market with a very small change in patients. You don't have to move all of your patients. You only have to get a small number of patients to decide to go someplace differently to make a hospital pay attention. Now, the dirty little secret of healthcare is that hospitals don't make 3% margins on their procedures. For a lot of their procedures, they make very big margins. So this chart, the left side, the purple bars are the costs, the right side are the revenues. And for some service lines, like cardiac services and oncology and other things, hospitals make very big margins. The reason why they make those very big margins is because for some other service lines, generally maternity care, mental health, other things, they actually lose money. Why do they lose money? Because they take all comers. That's the number two reason why hospitals are different than physicians. They take everybody. We expect them to take everybody. But some of those people can't pay. Some of those people get covered by Medicaid. Some people get covered by Medicare, which pays those low rates. So they end up having to charge you more for the things that your patients get, your employees get, to be able to make up the rest of the money. So no wonder the hospitals are concerned about losing some of the procedures that they actually use to subsidize all their operations. And the final piece of this little economics lesson is the so-called hospital physician alignment. So let's take colonoscopies. Everybody should be having a colonoscopy every 10 years over 50. Has everybody had their colonoscopy? So there's two places you can get a colonoscopy. You can go to a gastroenterologist's office and get a colonoscopy, or you can go to a hospital outpatient department to get a colonoscopy. How much does Medicare pay for those things? They pay the physician $400 if they do it in their office. They pay them $220 if they do it in the hospital. Now you'd say, wait a minute, I thought the hospital was more expensive. This is how much the doctor gets paid. And the reason why the doctor gets paid more is because the doctor's fee is covering not only the doctor's payment, but all the costs that they incur along with that. When they go to the hospital, the hospital gets paid separately for the colonoscopy. So guess what? It actually costs twice as much to get your colonoscopy in the hospital. Now, does a colonoscopy need to be done in the hospital? Nah. But think about this. So if the hospital is getting paid twice as much to do the colonoscopy as the physician is, do you think the hospital might be able to pay the gastroenterologist more to come work for the hospital to do the colonoscopies there? Or they could then maybe draw in some anesthesiologist to do some work too, et cetera? So that's the problem is that because of the way we pay, hospitals can actually pay physicians more if the, if the physicians come to work for the hospital than if they stay independent. So, not surprising that we're seeing a lot of people ending up working in hospitals because the hospitals actually can take all that extra money that they're making and pay them. 
So those are the problems with the fee-for-service today. We don't pay for things that actually are high-value care. We don't pay for phone calls when a patient has an urgent need. We don't pay for emails. We don't pay for nurses. We, don't, we can't move the money around between the silos. And people get paid less whenever they actually do the things that we ask them to do, which is to prevent complications, infections, and do, un, do fewer unnecessary procedures. And they don't get paid at all when the patient stays healthy. Now, people nationally have finally started to recognize this, that there is a problem with the fee-for-service system because of that fact. But people aren't really fixing that. What they're trying to do with payment reform today is they're given these little itty-bitty pay-for-performance bonuses, or these little itty-bitty per-member-per-month payments, or little itty-bitty shared savings payments, on top of what is still fundamentally a fee-for-service system. Now think about it. If you're getting paid that much fee-for-service and somebody gives you a little pay-for-performance bonus, who's mama? It's the fee-for-service system. So fortunately, though, there are better payment systems available. So there are ways to pay those primary care physicians in a more flexible way, but to give them accountability for the outcomes that they can take accountability for. There's a notion of bundles and warranties to be able to give people flexibility but accountability for the procedures they do. And there's a notion of a condition-based payment which is actually what patients want, is to have their condition treated, not necessarily to get lots of tests and procedures. So why not pay based on the condition rather than the procedure? And the good news is that these true payment reforms, not these tweaks to fee-for-services, true payment reforms actually allow win-win-win. They allow better care for the patients, less spending for you, and the providers can actually do better. Let me show you how. So every other industry in America gives warranties, right? Except healthcare, you'd say. Not possible in healthcare, right? Well, in fact, the Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania has been doing this for a number of years now. They didn't call it a warranty. The New York Times called it a warranty. They call it proven care. But basically, it's a single price for everything that happens during a person's hospital care, including what they get after they leave the hospital and any related complications or readmissions that they have. And they started doing this with cardiac bypass surgery, and they've been systematically expanding it ever since to maternity care or low back pain, things that don't even necessarily have to happen uh, in a hospital. What happened as a result of this? Well, these are their results for cabbages, bypass surgery. Not little itty-bitty statistically significant improvements. They got 20, 40, 60 percent reductions in complications, infections, and readmissions quickly in 18 months at a place that was already had a reputation for being a high quality leader. How'd they do that? Because no longer were they being paid for doing things, they were being paid based on the outcomes. And they had the flexibility to decide what they could uh, cut out to be able to do that. And guess what? They were able to use this to actually give reductions in premiums to employers in the community. So that in fact, this is a story about how teachers were able to get a raise because their premiums went down. Now, the myth that is developed is you have to be a Geisinger health system, a big integrated delivery system with employee docs in your own health plan to be able to do this. The earliest documented example in healthcare of anybody giving a warranty was a single doctor in Lansing, Michigan, orthopedic surgeon, shoulder and knee guy, said, I'll give a two year warranty. Anything goes wrong, I'll fix it free of charge. It's in the literature. Health plan paid less, doctor made more money, hospital made more money, patients were better off. Why? because they didn't have to do things based on the fact that what they were going to get paid for, they could focus on the outcomes. But it does take somebody to pay differently to get there, and I'll come back to that. You can't just do this on your own. Now, to understand this, first of all, warranty is not an outcome guarantee. You're not guaranteeing the outcome of the surgery or the procedure. When you buy a car with a warranty, nobody's guaranteeing you that your transmission is not going to break. What they're saying is if a transmission does break, we will fix it free of charge. And most warranties are limited warranties. They don't cover absolutely everything because not everything is preventable. But the other thing that's a mind bender lots of times for employers is that you would have to pay more than you do today for warranted care in healthcare per procedure. Now you'd say, but wait a minute, I thought I'm trying to save money here. Well, think about it though. In any other industry, when you buy a product with a warranty, would you expect to pay more for a product with a warranty than a product without a warranty? Of course you would, because you would expect that then you didn't have to pay for all the repairs. You might not be buying the best by extended warranty, but if you were buying a product that had a warranty came with it. So let me just show you an example. 
Quick example. So let's assume the hospital is doing a procedure they get paid $25,000 for it. They have a 10% readmission rate today. 10% of the people come back to the hospital in, in 30 days. And they get, when they come back, the hospital gets paid an extra $25,000 every time they do. Now, if you're paying for these, this care in the hospital, you're not paying $25,000 per procedure. You're paying $27,500 per procedure. Because when it goes well, you pay $25,000, and 10% of the time, you get stuck with an extra $25,000 bill. So on average, it's $27,500. Now, if you were this hospital and you wanted to offer this procedure with a warranty, so you say, I won't charge, I'm not going to charge anymore for the re readmissions. They happen, come out of our money. How much would you charge for this procedure? Well, the answer is you would charge $27,500. Because if you charge $27,500 per procedure, you would be getting exactly the same amount of money that you were getting before, because you wouldn't be getting paid extra for the readmissions. So why would you do that? Well, the answer is because all the incentives have changed now. Because if this hospital can actually reduce the readmission rate from 10% to 8%, their costs will go down, because they don't have to take care of those patients anymore on the readmission. But their payment won't go down. So they'll actually make more money. But we want to save you a little bit of money in healthcare, right? So this hospital can now come to you and say, I could actually now charge less than I was charging before, or have you spend less than you were spending before, and I could still make more money. And this virtuous cycle continues because if the hospital can keep driving down the readmission rate, they, their costs will go down, but their revenue won't go down in proportion to that, and they can continue to offer that at lower prices. And so in the end, you have better quality, lower readmission rates, better for the patient. You have lower prices, how much you're actually paying for the care, and the hospital is coming out ahead. Their margins are higher. Win, win, win. But it's because you're paying differently. This is actually aligning the financial incentives and the quality incentives. What's critical to this, though, is to have data. The doctors in the hospitals have to have data on how often these problems are occurring and how much they're costing, and generally they don't have that data. And you have to have data on how often those problems are occurring and how much they're costing, and generally you don't have that data, at least not formatted in the right way. And you both have to have the same data. And you both have to trust each other. Because if the data, if you have your own data, then you're going to sit around the table arguing over the pie charts, not actually coming to a better deal on outcomes. Now, you know, warranty is not the same price for everybody, so you'd say, you know, some patients are riskier, the warranty price would be higher, but in every case, you would still have the incentive to be able to get those complications, readmissions, infections down. Now, here's where it gets really tricky, and lots of people are talking now about warranties and bundles, and you're talking about bundles and warranties per procedure. Where it gets really tricky, though, is what if you don't do the procedure at all? So let me take a hypothetical example. So I've got a hypothetical physician here who sees 300 patients a year who come in for some problem that they have. Doctor gets paid $100 to see the patient. New patient, they spend more time with them, evaluate them. They decide that two-thirds of the patients are going to get the procedure. Doctor gets paid $600 for those procedures. Procedure's done in the hospital. Hospital gets paid $7,000 for the procedures. So the payer, the purchaser, whomever, is spending $1.5 million on those 300 patients. You want to know what I'm thinking about? Think stents, but it uh, could be anything. Key thing is, up to 10% of those procedures may be avoidable with patient choice or some other approach. Now, notice I'm not saying that the procedures were inappropriate. The procedures were appropriate. They weren't wrong to do. But the patient might decide that they didn't want to take the risk associated with that. Or maybe they want to try medication management and see if that would work as well to reduce their chest pain or their knee pain or whatever. Okay. Now, if this physician or hospital would even admit that they think that 10% of those procedures could be avoidable, what would happen? Health plan will rush in with a, re with a utilization re review, a prior authorization program to try to make sure that we're not doing 10% unnecessary procedures, which would be a really good deal for you. If it actually happened, you'd spend 10% less, but not a terribly good deal for the doctor or the hospital because they get paid per procedure. So they'd lose money. So is there a better way? Well, first of all, notice something. Most of the money's not going to the doctor. Less than 10% of the money's going to the doctor. So let's talk to the doctor and say, what could you do to help us here? So what if you said to the physician, I'll pay you more to spend that time with the patient 
on those uh, to try to decide whether they want the procedure or not, rather than having to rush them out the door so that you can get back to the cath lab to do more stents. So we pay them more, um, better for the patient. They do 10% fewer procedures. They might actually be able to get more money as a result of that and still save you money. So doctor could make more. You could spend less. Patient's better off because they're not getting unnecessary surgeries. So where does the money come from? Well, the money comes from the hospital, right? So does the hospital have to lose in order for the physician to win and for you to win? Well, the issue is what should matter to the hospital is their margins, not their revenues. And the way we pay today for healthcare, the only way they get higher margins, earlier example, is that they have to get more revenues. So what if we could fix that? So what if I actually said, so same numbers I just showed you, what if I said, let's look at the hospital's costs. So here's that $7,000 that the hospital is getting paid. I'm going to assume that half of that is fixed cost. Doesn't change depending on how many patients the, the hospital has. I'm going to assume 45% is variable. It's the cost of the stent. It's the cost of the other kind of disposables. And I'm going to assume that the hospital is getting a 5% margin on these procedures. Okay? Now, what would happen? I bet those of you all the way in the back wish you were sitting more up front, aren't you? Wouldn't you? Um, what would happen if you actually ended up doing 10% fewer procedures? Well, let's think through the economics of this. So the hospital's fixed costs are fixed. So therefore, the hospital still needs to get the $700,000 in fixed costs they were getting before. The hospital's variable costs are variable. So if you have 10% fewer procedures, you have 10% less variable costs. If the doctor is getting 2% more money, let's give the hospital 2% more money on their margin than they were getting before. Now, what's that all add up to? Well, it adds up to 4% less money than the hospital was getting before in revenue. But should the hospital care? Hospital's covering its fixed costs, it's covering its variable costs, and it's getting more margin than it was getting before with 4% less revenue. Not 10% less revenue, but 4% less revenue, because I looked at what the hospital's actual costs were. Now, what's it all add up for to you? Well, drum roll, it's actually 4% less spending than it was before also. So we actually end up with a win, win, win. Doctors making more money, hospitals making more money where it counts, and you are spending less. And the patient's better off because they're not getting a procedure that they really didn't end up needing in the first place that could have caused them other kinds of problems and kept them out of work when they didn't really need to be out of work. Now, what payment model supports that? Well, you don't want to go back and start sitting and renegotiating all the fees, right? Because what's your guarantee that they're actually going to be doing fewer procedures? And you can imagine the discussion when the hospital comes and says that pay me more per procedure now, and I Trust me, I'll do fewer of them. What you really want to do is to say, what I've got is 300 patients who have a health problem. I am spending now a little over $5,100 per patient to have that, that problem dealt with. So the hospital and the, and the doctor should come to you and say, you know what, we can do that for 4% less. Now give us that money for those patients and let us figure out how to redesign care. So they can decide how much the doctor needs and how much the hospital needs, and they can decide whether they're going to pay for more for office visits or procedures or whatever. Let them decide, not have you trying to negotiate over 7,000 CPT codes. This kind of condition-based payment actually puts them in, in charge of controlling costs, not you. And instead of spending all this time and money having health plans put all these programs in place, to watch over them and to watch everything that they do and try to control everything from somewhere else, put them in charge of controlling their own costs, which is what every one of you does in your own business every day. Now, once they actually have that control, they can start thinking about how to do things differently the way Geisinger did. So for example, the doctor might say, you know what, I think we could actually do those procedures at less expense. Maybe I don't need to use all those drug eluding stents, and maybe I could actually get the vendors to give us a discount on those stents. And if you did that, the doctor could make more money, the hospital could make even more money, and you could get a lower price because now all of a sudden they are in charge of figuring out 
how to reduce costs. And they can think about how to compete with other providers based on being able to do that. Today, they don't do that. Today, you make them compete on volume, do more procedures. What you want them to do is to compete on how efficiently they can do the ones that they're doing and do even fewer of them. Now, the opportunities and the solutions vary by specialty. In cardiology, it's using less expensive and invasive procedures. In orthopedic surgery, it's reducing infections and complications, less expensive surgery. In psychiatry, it's helping keep the patients with behavioral health issues out of the emergency room and out of the hospital. In maternity care, it's reducing elective C-sections and reducing the early deliveries and the use of the NICU. All those are opportunities. The barriers in the payment system are somewhat different, but they all are driven by the fee-for-service structure. And the payment models may be a little bit different in each case. But wouldn't it be better to be paying people on that basis where they can actually control costs and outcomes in the way we're paying them today? Now, these are not my ideas. These are actually ideas from physicians. And the major national specialty societies are actually working on this. In fact, you have here in Wisconsin, the local chapter of the American College of Cardiology wants to implement a program just like I talked about here. What's the problem? They can't get anybody to pay them that way. Not just them. Neurology, gastroenterology, oncology, radiology, all want to be paid differently because they are sick of the fee-for-service system too and what it makes them do and the fact that they can't give good care to their patients. But they need somebody to pay them differently to be able to get there. What's the biggest barrier? Health plans don't want to change. Health plans don't want to change the way they pay physicians. And it's not good enough to get one payer to change. Because what's the physician supposed to do? Okay, I'll see, I'll keep you from getting an infection. I'll give all the rest of you an infection. Doctors don't work that way. Hospitals don't work that way. So they've got to be paid by everybody. Now, I'm not worried that all health plans aren't going to do something to change payment because there's such pressure around it. What I'm worried about is they're all going to change payment differently. And the physicians and hospitals are going to have 17 different payment systems because all the health plans are going to come to you and say, guess what? I have an even better payment system than Humana does. No, no, no. United has the best system. No, Aetna has the best system. Right? What we want to be doing is competing about outcomes, not about who has the best payment system. So what about the patient? Everything I've talked about so far is the payment system. How do you pay providers and give them the ability and the incentive to keep their patients well, to avoid unnecessary services, to be efficient, and to coordinate with other folks? But it takes two to tango. Patients also have to get into the equation, and that's where the benefit design comes into place. Because the patients have to have the ability and the incentives to improve their health, take their meds, actually allow somebody to coordinate their care, and pick the highest value providers and services. And guess what? We have really crappy benefit designs today. People in healthcare, all of you, are obsessed with co-pays, co-insurance, and high deductibles. Everybody acts like as if that is the way to control healthcare costs. And the problem is it doesn't. First of all, all those $5,000 high deductible health plans are actually discouraging people from getting the kind of care that they really need. And I think one of the best examples, or worst examples, I should say, of this is we have this almost complete disconnect today between pharmacy benefits and medical benefits. So your PBMs come in to you and proudly tell you how much money they saved on pharmacy this year. What you should ask them is how many people ended up going to the hospital as a result of that. Because if you're those primary care physicians who are trying to manage the chronic disease patients, how do they do that? They get them to take their chronic disease medication, maintenance medications. If they can't afford their chronic disease maintenance medications, What's the physician supposed to do about that? The worst example I ever heard of that was when the transplant surgeons you know, said, you know, our patients, some of them can't afford to take their anti-rejection drugs. We paid for the transplant, but then we won't pay for the drugs that actually make that transplant worthwhile. The other problem is that co-pays, co-insurance, and high deductibles actually give the patients virtually no incentive to actually pick the best care and the expensive stuff. To show you that, let me take you out of healthcare for just a second. So a couple years ago, I was in Boston. I had to be in Cleveland the next day. You can see I'm an insane traveler sometimes. And I, was, I live in Pittsburgh, so I was going to fly from Boston back to Pittsburgh, drive up to Cleveland. And the people in Cleveland said, why would you do that, Harold? Why don't you just fly from Boston to Cleveland? And I said, well, that's an interesting idea. Let me see what that would cost. 
So I looked up the options. So my first option was I could take US Airways through Philadelphia. Anybody here flown through Philadelphia? You have to take a bus between planes in Philadelphia. It's not exactly a pleasant experience. So I could do that for $622, or I could go nonstop on United for $1,100, or I could go nonstop first class on United for $1,355. Now, what if I were being reimbursed for my travel the way we pay in healthcare? So, Harold, $100 copayment. Which way are you going to go to Cleveland? 10% coinsurance. Now, it would cost me $74 more to go United nonstop first class, but who here would not pay $74 to avoid Philadelphia and get unlimited alcohol? <laughs> $500 high deductible travel reimbursement policy, I'm taking first class. What's the only thing that actually encourages me to go through Philadelphia and get drunk on my own money? Um, is to say what we do today is that we'll pay you for lowest coach fare. If you want to go first class and pay the difference, go right ahead. So let's look at health care. I need to get my knee replaced. Place to do for $20,000, $25,000, $30,000, $1,000 copayment, where am I going? There must be something better about the $30,000 place. I don't know what it is, but if they charge more, it must be because they're good. Plus, they have these US News and World Report ads all over the place. 10% coinsurance, out of pocket max, I'm going to the $30,000 place. What's the only thing that actually encourages me to go to the $20,000 place? Is to say, we know you can get a good quality knee replacement for $20,000. If you want to go to the place that charges $30,000, go right ahead, but pay the difference. CalPERS, California Public Employees Retirement System, is doing this in California. So they found that they were paying between $15,000 and $110,000 for knee replacements across the state. So they looked and they found that within uh, uh, easy access of all their employees everywhere in the state, there was a hospital with good quality that would do it for $30,000 or less. So they said to the employees, we'll pay $30,000 up to $30,000. If you want to take out a second mortgage on your house and go to the $110,000 place to be our guest, we're going to pay $30,000. Guess what happened? Employees switched. Guess what happened? The expensive places lowered their prices. That is far better, that tiering is far better than narrow networks. It's letting the patients decide themselves where to go not you having to decide for them that they can't ever go to the other place no matter what. And you know what? Remember my earlier chart? Only a small number of patients have to move to be able to make the health system pay attention. So if you're creating accountable care organizations in the community, have them define their prices and say to the employees, we'll pay for a good quality accountable care organization, we'll go to the more expensive place, go right ahead. Now, you might say, this is insane, Harold, no one would ever do this. Well, this was actually done in Minnesota back in the 1990s. The employers in Minnesota got fed up with health plans. And they say, we're going to go directly and talk to the doctors and hospitals, and we're going to ask them to come to us and give us a bid on what it would cost to manage all the costs of care for a group of patients. Risk-adjusted payment, so the employer was still keeping the fundamental insurance risk as to whether employees were sick or not, but then they asked the providers to take over responsibility for that. And then they laid that out for the employees. They said, here's your choices. Here's all the systems in the community. Here's what they cost. If you want to go to the more expensive places, you'll pay more. Up to you. Guess what happened? Employees switched. Not many of them, but enough to actually make people pay attention. And guess what happened? The expensive systems lowered their prices because they couldn't afford to lose that many patients. So it works. It actually does work. And the third thing that's wrong with the current benefit designs is we don't ask the patients to tell us who their doctor is. Just say to them, who is your primary care physician so that we can tell them now you're accountable. If a patient wants to switch, let them, but have them say, who's your cardiologist? Who is your PCP? Very simple thing to do. Now, lots of people around the country are obsessed today with transparency about prices. And if we just have transparency about prices, it will fix everything. The problem is it will not fix everything. So let me look, for example, I've got two providers. They post their prices. Provider number one, $25,000. Provider number two is $23,000. <coughs> Provider number two is a better choice, right? Well, what if number one has a lower complication rate? 
such that when you add it all up, it turns out that the total amount that ends up going to provider number one is lower than provider number two. That's why your quality path initiative is so important, because you can't just look at price. You have to look at quality. And what you really want to do is to have these bundled and warrantied payments so that the providers can come to you and give you an all-in price for that care. Not suddenly notice that all these extra charges appeared after you put in this program. Those bundled and warrantied payments allow you to compare apples to apples and the same thing at the condition level. Now, one other thing I'll just mention to finish my story. What did I do? I flew to Pittsburgh and I drove to Cleveland. How much did it cost me to go through Pittsburgh? It cost me $188 to do that. Nonstop, no Philadelphia. No drinks, but still nonstop. So why was it so much cheaper to go to Pittsburgh than to Cleveland? It, is, it, is it that much closer? Well, yeah, it's 70 miles closer. Hmm, is this modern airfare $900 to go 70 more miles? The difference was there was only one nonstop choice to Cleveland. There were three choices. Pittsburgh. So what you have to think about is, in your community, as all these accountable care organizations are forming, are you going to have several or are you going to have one? Because if you want to get some price competition, you have to have choices for people to be able to make. Now, both benefits and payment are controlled by health plans today. But guess who controls health plans? It's purchasers. And purchasers working together through a strong purchaser coalition like the Alliance are in a position to make those health plans change. And the reason that you need to be thinking about that is because health plans have no incentive to change. I'll tell you why in a second. So what if they won't change? Well, you purchasers need to say, we're going to switch health plans. And the experience nationally of health plans is that you are all big bags of wind. You won't actually change your health plans if they don't want to do something differently. If you do, they will change. Trust me, they will change. But recognize, they have no incentive to change. If you're a self-insured purchaser, for the health plan to change payment models and everything else, they're going to have to spend a bunch of money to implement a new payment system. And if it reduces spending, where's the savings going to go? You. Not exactly a good business model for the health plan to spend all the money to put the new payment system in and you get the savings. So is it any wonder that they're kind of dragging their feet about doing all that stuff? They'd like to have that claims payment system of theirs last for a while longer. The best approach is for you to actually sit down and start talking directly to the providers. Because you the purchaser and they the provider are the ones who actually have your interests aligned because you win if they figure out how to compete and deliver lower cost, higher quality care. They win if you pay them in a way that actually rewards them for doing that and so that they can actually get paid when they keep the patients well. Now what happens to the health plan? Well, the health plan's still there, but the health plan does what you and the provider, your true partners, your true contractors, your true suppliers say they need to be able to make this work. Now, you generally need a facilitator of some kind to help this happen because there isn't a lot of trust today between the people who are buying health care and the people who are selling care. So getting a neutral facilitator who can help some of those discussions, who can provide some technical assistance and some data. And fortunately, you actually in Wisconsin have mechanisms for doing that through the Partnership for Payment Reform and the Wisconsin Health Information Organization to provide the data that you need, claims data with prices, to be able to do that analysis and to help you talk to each other. But you have to be willing to talk to each other to be able to do that. So what would I say employers should be doing? I would say you should start working directly with those providers to look for those win-win-win strategies to be able to reduce the cost of care. Where are the opportunities today for reducing costs without rationing? And what payment reforms and benefit changes are needed to be able to achieve those things? Get and analyze the data. It's data that you both have to trust. And then work on that basis to figure out how you divide up the risk. You've got to look at both utilization and pricing. You've got to get data on quality. Again, that's where your quality path initiative is really important so that you're not paying for poor quality care. And then you've got to say, we're going to use health plans that will pay that way. Because that is the biggest barrier for the folks who want to, in the healthcare system that want to change do that. Now, 
I don't have a book, but I've got lots of free publications that you can read, which you can download from this site uh, if you want to. And I would encourage you to learn as much about this stuff as you uh, can, because it is very important and it's very complex. It is admittedly complex. But, you know, we have 7,000 CPT codes today and 700 DRGs. This stuff I'm talking about is nothing compared to the complexity of the current system.